Now, after the actor Sidney Poitier, and before actors Denzel Washington and Wesley Snipes, there was a guy named Howard Rollins. And they used to call him the modern day Sidney Poitier. But he would tell people that he's not the new Sidney Poitier. He's the first Howard Rollins. Carol O'Connor, his co-star on the show, in the heat of the night said, he worked with many talented actors, but never one more gifted than Howard Rollins. You know what? I'm not even going to waste no time in this story. This story is crazy. Let's get into it. Now, Howard Rollins was born on October 17th, 1950 in Baltimore, Maryland. Now, he was the youngest of four kids to his parents in which his mom was a domestic worker and his father was a steel worker. Growing up as a kid, he loved to play the saxophone and after graduating high school, he went to Townsend State College where he studied theater, but he really wanted to be a school teacher. At 17 years old, he had a summer job as a porter at Sears right across the street from his house. But see, one day, one of his friends named Frank Knox had liked this girl who was going to a casting call at a local Baltimore theater. So Howard's friend, Frank Knox, convinced him to go with him to the casting call for more support even though he never acted a day in his life and really never considered acting at all. With nothing to lose, Howard auditioned and once he started reading the script, the director saw something in him and he ended up getting a role for a play called Of Mice and Men. After that, he realized that that's what he wanted to do. He wanted to be an actor. Now, at first, his parents didn't really care as long as he kept going to school. But when he landed a role of Slick in the PBS first black soap opera called Our Street, which was about an African-American family continuing to search for dignity and respect in West Baltimore, for that role, he dropped out of school to do it full time. And that's when his parents became concerned. And his parents told him, Black people don't become movie stars. You need to get a real job. But Howard had his mind made up and was ready to make a career out of acting. So he went to New York with only $300 in his pocket and started looking for acting gigs. And for him, it really wasn't hard to get roles because he was naturally gifted, which impressed the producers. He ended up getting roles in Broadway plays like we interrupt this program, which was a mystery thriller. He was the lead in the off-Broadway drama called Metal on a Rag. He did The Mighty Gents with Morgan Freeman and GR Point, which was a Vietnam War drama. After that, more civil rights type movies were coming his way, like the miniseries King and um, Roots, The Next Generations. But his next role would change his life and take him to the next level, which was the movie Ragtime as Cole House Walker Jr. Now, Howard said in an interview when he saw O.J. Simpson, Lou Gossip Jr., and Richard Pryor audition for the same role, he thought for sure he didn't get the part, but he was so happy they gave the role to him, he said he fell on the floor and started crying. And he was nominated for all types of awards for that role, like an Academy Award nomination for Best Supporting Actor, Golden Glove nominations for Best Supporting Actor in a Motion Picture, and New Star of the Year in a Motion Picture. That movie was also Samuel L. Jackson and Debbie Allen first time appearing in a movie. Now, after that, he appeared in a few more TV type movies, but in 1981, he joined the cast of the soap operas All My Children as an FBI agent and then the next year he was in a soap opera called Another World as Ed Harding in which he was nominated for a daytime Emmy for his character Nat. Now 
The following year, he plays civil rights leader Mega Everest in a movie called For Us, The Living, The Mega Everest Story. And for that role, he won the NAACP Image Award for Outstanding Actor in a Drama Series. But in 1984, he played Captain Richard Davenport in one of my favorite movies of all time called A Soldier Story. That's my movie right there, man. And in that movie, he played a black military officer who is also a lawyer and is sent to investigate the murder of a black sergeant in Louisiana during the Jim Crow days around World War II. And it's crazy because a lot of now famous black actors was in that movie like Denzel Washington, David Allen Greer, um, Robert Townsend, Patti LaBelle, and many more. Now, A Soldier's Story won and was nominated for all types of awards and he did a great job in that movie, man. He did he, superb acting in that movie. Now, one of the reasons his acting was so good in that movie was because while shooting that movie, his father had died. And to keep his mind off his death, he just focused and shot extra scenes. I'm definitely going to watch that movie this week, man. That's my movie right there. Now, after that movie... That was kind of the end of his movie career and he started to focus and land more roles for TV dramas like the show Wild Side, which was a Western series on ABC, but that show got canceled because the ratings were low compared to the Cosby show and Magnum P.I. during that time. But his next role would prove to be his biggest in his acting career, which is homicide detective Virgil Tibbs on the show In the Heat of the Night. Now, my grandma, man, she loved that show. I can still hear that theme song in my head when it comes on. In the heat of the night. But anyway, now, that show came from the original movie back in 1967 starring legendary actor Sidney Poitier. And when they did the reboot in 1988, Carol O'Connor, who played the police chief, wanted Howard Rollins from the start because of his resume. Him and Wesley Snipes was up for that role and Howard was chosen. You know what's crazy? Even though he played a racist, Archie Bunker on the show, All in the Family, man, Carol O'Connor put a lot of black actors on. He gave he gave Sherman Hemsley his first shot as George Jefferson and played a part of the spinoff on the Jeffersons. Now, the show in the heat of the night was a hit in its debut, but that same year, Howard Rollins was arrested on drug and traffic charges after being stopped for going more than 100 miles per hour on an interstate in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. He was charged with possessing crack cocaine, first offense drunk driving and speeding, and was released on a $5,000 bond. Plus, the judge ordered him to make an anti-drug video. During the third season of the show, he missed five episodes because of his drug problem and had to take six weeks off to enter a drug and alcohol rehab program. And he was talking about killing himself just three days before Christmas because he didn't want to rehab. And that's when all the rumors was coming out saying that Carol O'Connor had fired him from the show, but that wasn't true. When Carol O'Connor heard the rumor, he threatened to sue the tabloids because he really cared for Howard. Also during that time, while he was off the show, Howard starred in a movie called On the Block. After that, he returned back to the show in the heat of the night and everything was all good and his popularity continued to grow. But years later, he went back to his old habits and started showing up late to the set and sometimes not even showing up at all. In 1992, he was sentenced to two days in jail, fined a thousand dollars, and had his license revoked for driving under the influence of a tranquilizer. Hmm. Around 1993, he was arrested again for driving under the influence and reckless driving and had to spend about a month in jail. And because he continued to get in trouble and have legal and personal issues, he ended up getting dropped from the show in the heat of the night. And they replaced him with Carl Weathers, who y'all probably know as Apollo Creed from the movie Rocky. Also around that time, 
he found out he had some health issues and rumors was out saying he had HIV and AIDS. Now, in an interview, Howard admitted he was addicted to drugs and alcohol, but denied that he had AIDS. Plus, you know, friends and staff also denied those reports like Carol O'Connor, who said HIV victims lose weight. If anything, he has an overweight problem. <laughs> if he's sick, he's the strongest looking victim I ever seen. Now, after he completed his rehab once again, he was invited back as a guest star on several episodes in the last and final season of In the Heat of the Night. But, you know, more legal problems like two outstanding Georgia warrants led to him being totally banned from the county where the series was being filmed. After that, it became hard for him to find work. And he started telling people he wasn't getting cast for roles because he was black. But he did end up getting a role for an episode on the show, New York Undercover. Man, that was my show too, New York Undercover. And he did land a couple other roles like the movie Drunks and Harambe with Marilyn Santana. Now finally feeling that his acting career was getting back on track. Six weeks later, he got some bad news from the doctor saying he had lymphatic cancer and tested positive for HIV AIDS. After hearing that news, close friends of his say he went crazy and lost his mind. He changed his appearance and started dressing as a woman, wearing sparkling gowns, high-priced wigs and high heels and kept telling himself he was a woman and would look for trans. They say he even appeared on a talk show in feminine looking clothes. But on December 7th, 1996, Howard Rollins was found alone and unconscious in his studio apartment with blood bubbling from his mouth and nostrils. After being rushed to the hospital, he later died of complications from AIDS-related lymphoma cancer. Now his agent, Roseanne Gates, said that he died of bacteria infection from septic shock due to complications from lymphoma and said that the AIDS rumor was never confirmed. But here's the crazy part though, check this out now. For months, his neighbor named Howard Bright became so worried that he started to visit Howard Rollins three times a day because he knew Howard was depressed and lonely and worn out from his sickness. Around 1 p.m., he went to check up on him and he heard this gurgling sound and that's when he said he saw a vision of hell. He saw Howard stretched out on his back in his bed, gasping for air and staring blankly at the ceiling. He then asked Howard if he could speak, but he didn't respond. Then he tried to lift him, but his chest just rattled and he gurgled as though his insides were about to pour out. That's when he called the paramedics. As the paramedics lifted him from the bed, the gurgling grew louder and started pouring from his mouth and nose and he was drowning in it. They started sticking tubes down his throat and started pumping the blood out of his lungs into small plastic sacks. And blood splattered everywhere, he said. The floor was covered in blood. He later died. Now, after his death, his neighbor of 18 years named Howard Wright, who I spoke about earlier, told Globe magazine that Howard Rollins was so sick during the last couple of months that it took, took him 10 minutes to help him down the stairs. He said Howard's kidney infection put him in the hospital and when he, when he came home, it caused him so much pain that there were times when he could barely walk. And about a year ago, he told him that he was HIV positive, even though he hated to talk about it. He said Howard told him that he had bacteria in his stomach that had spread throughout his body and it was nothing they could do about it. When Howard was home, all he did was sit in the dark with the shades pulled down, watching TV or he was on the telephone calling people all over the country. 
in his last months, his only comfort had been dressing up and weeks before he died, he even joked to friends that he wanted to be buried as a woman in a golden black beaded cocktail dress with makeup and false eyelashes. And for years, he led a secret double life dressing in drag, cruising his Manhattan neighborhood as a woman named Turalura Gofar, pursed lips with his hand on his hips and transform into a woman. When he dressed as a woman, he left all his cares behind. He wasn't a drug addict or an AIDS patient. He was a sassy, sexy temptress. Wow, that's crazy, man. He also said Howard Rollins' favorite thing in the whole world was showing off a new outfit to a friend, especially winter and symbols like a lady's coat over skirt and stockings. And when he was feeling well, he loved to dress in a spectacular women's outfit and go to trans clubs looking for male lovers. That's what his neighbor of 18 years named Howard Wright, who was also an actor, said about Howard. Now, another neighbor named Art Franco said Howard Rollins would get high on drugs, dress as a woman, and strut his stuff. And when people would say, hi, Howard, He'll say, excuse me, I'm Tuvalura Gopher. But near the end, he said the cross-dressing masquerade just was pathetic. Another neighbor named Marcy Hirsch said it was the saddest thing she ever saw when she dropped off some groceries for him. And Howard was eating haagen ice cream, wearing a dress and a blonde wig, watching reruns of his show. Man, that's sad, man. That's terrible, man. Painful way to go, though, man. Painful way to go. And on October 25th, 2006, he was inducted into the Great Blacks and Wax Museum located in Baltimore, Maryland, making him the first person from Maryland to be inducted. He was 46 years old. R.I.P. Howard Rollins.